Let's switch it and see if it works. Cool. Ah, great. OK, I'm Malcolm Sparks from Juxt, and it's great to be back here for a second year. I'm going to give a talk called The Universe as a Value. So some capacity requirements. Um, I got from Wikipedia that there's about 10 to the power of 80 particles. Um, but we want to capture not just position and velocity, we also want to know when the particle is as well. So the age of the universe is about 13 billion years, um, I, but it's going to hopefully last longer than that. So I've estimated the lifetime based on the evaporation of supermassive black holes, and it um, ends up taking ages and ages. So I've got a lot of seconds there, uh, but lots of things can happen in the universe in one second. So we want to move down to the kind of granularity of a pixel. And so I've taken Planck's time constant, which is 10 to the minus 43, which gives us 10 to the 150 instants. And then we've got to multiply it by our particles. So I'm getting about 10 to the 230, if that's, that's, a, that's enough. And so this is, our, this is our universe. This is our value. And it's not just the past or present or future. Those terms don't make sense. Everything here is fixed. So, sorry, no free will. Um, the future is completely determined. Um, now we've got to think about an observer. So I've modeled an observer as a closure atom. And every observer needs to observe a universe. And Einstein tells us that time is relative to an observer. In fact, two observers can have two different points of view as to the ordering events in a universe. So that means we've got multiple universes, OK? So we need a set, which I've called you, which is the set of all possible universes, OK? I know what some of you are thinking. We're going to need a bigger computer. So I've got some closure code for you here, which is going to uh, select from this set. So what we want to do is write a function that's going to take one universe value and move it to another universe, which looks like it's you know, the next universe. Um, so I've written a function here that is going to filter out from our set of all possible universes um, and just take the consistent ones. What do I mean by consistent? Well, they've got to have the same past with respect to this value of time, but they can have different futures. We don't care about the futures, but the, 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 the pasts have got to be reasonably consistent. And then we're going to filter them uh, and then I've used a function in Clojure called randnth, which is going to pick one at random. Now, if you're still clinging on to the idea of free will, you're, you're free to replace that with a, a free will function or put free will in as a, a parameter. I haven't, but, but you can. This next piece of code here um, is switching the observer from one universe to another. Now, we have our next U universe. We destructure the atom and we get the universe and the time for the observer. And then we increment the time, but also work out the next universe, and that becomes the next frame that the observer sees. So that's the next value that goes into the atom. Okay. Now, it doesn't matter how long next you takes. It doesn't have to take Planck time. It can take millions of years, as long as from the point of view of the observer, um, who's kind of just in suspended animation, as long as it feels to them uh, that it's the next frame, then it's OK. So we'll have the computing resources. And here we can create now the illusion of time, which is an iterate switch universe on the observer. So we're calling switch universe and creating a whole sequence of universes. And we're running do run. OK, now this is where um, we've created, finally, the illusion of time. Um, and I think this uh, problem here is that, that, that we're, we're going to need vast computing resources. So we have to optimize. We have to find some way of cheating. Um, and I've got this great animation from a lovely site called Quantum Made, Made Simple, which explains that um, particles or, 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 or quantum objects look like probabilistic waves, if, if you're familiar with quantum mechanics. The general idea is that we don't know what the particle is uh, until we observe it. Um, and it's the act of observation that makes the particle uh, real. So I think this um, quantum mechanics is 
um, actually just lazy evaluation. You know when you have a, a, you can have infinite sequences in Clojure and you can pass them around. It's only when you call print that suddenly you get this collapse of the wave function. Um, so I'm pretty sure that it's a, a lazy evaluation. Um, now I said simulation. I'm sorry I gave the game away there. I, I, I didn't mean to, but um, yes, the universe is just a complete simulation, or so many people think. Elon Musk, in fact, says that uh, he feels that the odds that we're living in base reality are one in billions. And I think when you're putting thousands of driverless cars on the roads of America, it's quite comforting to believe that none of it is real. <laughs> I've got a nice... There's a really great article on the... Well, it's not a great article, but it's just quite funny. We might be living in a computer program, but it may not matter. I think it's a, a great title. Um, just a quick question before we move on. Is mathematics real? I mean, you'd have thought that but we're talking about the physics might be a simulation, but surely two and two equal four, that's universal. Um, so I don't know how you feel about that question. There is some evidence to the contrary. Um, one is that the foundations of mathematics are, are curiously evasive. They're very, very hard to pin down. Um, and there's another aspect, which is physics or maths. Maths seems to be very unreasonable at predicting physics. When Einstein came up with E equal mc squared, he didn't make some nuclear bombs and explode them and measure the heat and, and weigh them at the end. He actually did it on paper, and he got it right. He got the sums right. So there's this curious connection between mathematics and physics, and it may be that it's actually just the same program, and that is the explanation. So who knows? But there's one really compelling piece of information, uh, you know, evidence that, that really gets me, which is this equation here. Does anyone know what this produces? It produces that. Now, you've got to be joking, right? You know, if that's not an Easter egg, I don't know what is. <laughs> Infinite uh, complexity from a simple equation. So let's move. Um, we've seen all these ideas before. In ClojureScript and Ohm and React, we have a thing called an app state. And an app state is stored in an atom. It's our universe. And we can deref it. Um, and here's how. We take some universe. This is my universe. We deref it. And we get two qualities. It's really nice. We get consistency. So when we render this value, we might be rendering it to a virtual DOM. This value is constant. It doesn't change so it's consistent. That's a really nice property. Another uh, useful property is concurrency. Nobody, it doesn't matter how long it takes to render this atom, this value, because nobody's waiting for us. The, the atom can be moving. The atom can be taking on new values. And so we've not acquired a lock. No, we're not slowing down anything. We're just taking our time, and we've got concurrency. Let's compare this model with object orientation. Um, and I think that in UIs, we've, we've found quite a lot of success by using app state compared to object orientation, which is really hard to manage. You have all this changing state, changing at different times, scattered everywhere. And not only that, we've scaled that out to distributed objects in our systems, whether you call it Corba, um, ESBs, SOA, web services, microservices. Object orientation is really lots of changing states scattered all around the place. Um, so I wanted to see what it would mean to take an app state, the app state model that we see in our browsers, and move it to the server side. So I've been experimenting with our own website because it doesn't matter if I break it, and you know it's a, a, a it's a non-trivial system, and we have quite a lot of state in our website. Um, uh, like most other websites do. Um, so we built a record called AppState, and we can deref it. But when we do deref it, um, we do a refresh on a, on a big graph. So this is my universe as a graph. This is the AppState record. And when we dereference it, it, it kind of walks the tree and asks everything, are you up to date? And if you are up to date, uh, if you're not up to date, then the thing asks you, can you update yourself? And usually, if nothing has changed, this is a very quick operation. Um, why can it be quick? 
how can we, uh, what, what tools and techniques are available to make this a very quick operation, this, this refresh? Um, one is the Git SHA-1. So we can detect if there's been any changes in any of our Git repositories by, by comparing a 40-byte string. It's really, really fast. So if nothing has changed, we know that very quickly. We have Datomic in our system. Other people use Oracle. There are new databases coming out that have this idea of, a, of time travel where you can snapshot a database and get that, those qualities of consistency and concurrency. Um, then if you're using web services or microservices, you can, um, if you're using HTTP, you can make use of HTTP hashes and entity tags so that services will return a 304, not modified, rather than compute the whole response again. So you can construct a, a universe, a system, that has these properties. Um, we, in the development environment, or in, in, in fact, in this environment, we um, have background watches that look, uh, that run in the background and look on the files and in the database to see if anything has changed. And if they have changed, then they cause an update to ripple up so that the next app state um, is very quick. Um, so the result is that we have instant feedback. It feels like a REPL. Every time that we make a change to the system, so John can make a change to uh, an article, um, and he might make a change to the title of an article, and that will make that will cause the blog index to be out of date because we have a menu of blog articles on our website. And so this one gets rebuilt. And because these blog articles are all in markdown, it's, it's not reasonable to expect us to parcel that markdown on every request. But if we can keep this graph up to date, then we can deref on every single request or at any time that we want to uh, observe the system. It feels more and more like a tactile REPL. We have no build, um, great no build, but really that we've kind of, we, we sort of do have a build, but we put the, we have um, more and more, we've put things that we used to do in a build, so like um, resize images and upload CSS and stuff and, and, and do SAS compilation. More and more we've moved those build components into the system. So the system is sort of monitoring and building itself all the time. We have no continuous integration, or rather, we have continuous integration. We, we're continuously integrating all the time just by pushing changes to the system. Um, and we have zero tests, yay. You know, no test suite to maintain, even better, more free time. Um, or rather, the, test has got, the, the system itself has lots of defenses and preconditions and, and maintains its own quality and tests itself. And we can, we can do this in a, a QA environment if we, we really want to test it externally before we go live. So this reminds me of, you know, we're at a, a closure conference. We're, we're talking about Lisp. We have John McCarthy on our T-shirts. And Paul Graham once said that there's only been really two main uh, strands of programming models. There's, there's only two families, great families of programming. Uh, there's the C family, which includes Java and Ruby and Python and Haskell and all those, which is uh, where we, we start off with some code and we compile it and then we run our test suite and then we create uh, Uber jars and we upload those into Docker images and, and so on and so forth. We have a compilation build chain. Or there's the Lisp family. I'll leave you with two quotes. Um, I saw this quote by Bob Stutterford in, on Twitter, DevOps, light programming, but with a 15-minute REPL. Now, 15 minutes is much better than overnight builds. I mean, it, it is an improvement, but I think we can do better, and 15 minutes does seem still to be a long time. Um, there's a great uh, episode on software engineering radio um, by, with Dick Gabriel, and he... Um, it's a really, really good episode to listen to if you want to know the kind of foundations of Lisp. But he looks at Lisp and says it's, it's really like you create an environment, you run it up, and you start building it like a city. You keep it running all the time, and you make small changes and tests and experiments. And that's what it should feel like to be in a Lisp system. And we write in a Lisp, and yet we borrow all of the metaphors from the C family of languages. You know, our compiler is not going to be as good as the Haskell compiler. We don't have a type system. 
Um, the JVM takes ages to start, so we're playing away from home, and we want to get back onto where uh, w w we should experiment in building systems that are more like Lisp. So here's a closing thought. As Lisp programmers, can we build systems that better exploit the advantages of our language heritage? Okay, so that's, uh, that's my talk over. I'm just going to point out there's a, there's a very interesting place in space-time that if you have free will, you can steer your observers <laughs> towards so that you can arrive at close proximity to it in space-time. I'm going to stop talking like this because it's, it's just hard and stupid. But there are some tickets remaining, and we'd love to see you there. It's a conference in England that we're organizing. It's about three or four weeks away. There's still tickets left, and um, uh, we, we've got uh, a big roster of speakers, and uh, we, we'd love to see some of you come over and join us for the event. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for this talk. Um, I really think the analogy of physics, of quantum physics and time in the programming is really brilliant. The thing is, um, I want to go back a bit. Um, there is a kind of a constraint set in quantum physics, which is a Lorentz invariance for these universes, which limits the number of possible universes the observer can see, basically, mm -hmm. or this state transformation. Uh, you told us that there is no tests in the system, right? Um, but do you have any kind of this validation built in in the system? Yeah, that's the point. There's not so many tests outside the system that run on the dead code. There's more tests inside the system that run on, um, you know, there, there'd be schema and specs and preconditions and things that, that, that try to test. Uh, we have a lot of um, validation logic on the requests that come in dynamically, so we produce 400 errors and, and so on. Um, so that's, yes, it's really about putting quality and testing inside a system, even if it slows it down. It's just kind of, that, that's the th thing, you, that's the sacrifice you, you accept, you take on. Um, on the, uh, so on the Lorentz universes, um, the limit of number of universes, I think, um, yeah, I, I um, I mean, does anyone else have something to say? I mean, this is stuff is pretty hard. I mean, I've only kind of read a few kind of physics books and things. I've got some, you know, come and I'll tell you the sort of books I've read if you come and talk to me afterwards. But it's, uh, you know, yeah, I think it's quite, it's quite fun to, uh, to compare, um, you know, look at quantum physics like a game, really. I mean, I've, I've got a game I'm playing on the PS4 called No Man's Sky. I don't know if you, you, anyone's seen it. And I'm quite content to to play it knowing that I know there's sort of 15 quintillion star systems, um, but I know that my Xbox isn't calculating all of them at the same time, you know, that it's only doing my frame, and I, I'm, I'm happy with that. So I think that kind of taking that idea and seeing the universe in that way is quite interesting. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Looks like there's no more questions. Okay. Thank you.